Thank you. I am glad you have asked me to speak today on the vegetarian diet and philosophy because I find during the course of my travels that this is one subject in which more and more people are getting interested. Even in the last 10 years, I find that the number of people who want to get onto a vegetarian diet, provided somebody tells them what is the advantage of a vegetarian diet, is much larger than it was. It's growing every year. The number of people who want to become vegetarians is large. They want answers to a few simple questions. And I think it is time that a society like yours, like the Vegetarian Health Society, provides those answers. You will notice that if you do provide the answers, there are hundreds of thousands of people waiting on the threshold of vegetarianism to come on and adopt the vegetarian diet. And if there are benefits beyond the diet, in terms of developing human awareness or higher level of awareness, that will be a great day and your society will have contributed a great deal to human progress if you can take people on to better diets and from diet to better levels of awareness. I am here to very briefly deal with the subject which is the subject of your main occupation as the Vegetarian Health Society. I would first of all say that it has been acknowledged that the biological structure of man is designed for a vegetarian diet. This has been examined by experts who have seen the size of the teeth, the molars, the structure of the jaw, the structure of the systems of digestion, the stomach, the intestines, and after an analysis, they have come to the conclusion that the human body has been designed to take in vegetarian diet. In all living creatures, there are certain differentials, especially in the structure of the teeth, in the system of digestion, which distinguishes them from vegetarian and non-vegetarian diets. Animals who live upon flesh foods have a different structure, and animals who live on vegetables have a different structure. It is not necessary that the animal should be big or small. Very small animals are living in nature on non-vegetarian diets and very large animals are living on vegetarian diets. But it seems that nature has differentiated while constructing physical bodies for these beings into the categories of vegetarian and non-vegetarian animals. And fortunately, man comes in the category of vegetarian animal. Therefore, you will realize that if a man has given up vegetarian food and has gone on to non-vegetarian food in search of something for his palate, for his taste buds, he has become unnatural. A man taking non-vegetarian food is eating unnatural food because the food that he is taking is not designed for the bodily structure which he possesses. This is the basic difference, physically speaking. But of course, man is the only animal that has reason and intellect and the ability to find out what he should do. Man is the only animal that has the exercise of free will. Man is the only animal that exercises choices through the process of deliberation. Therefore, man is unique in that he can deliberately decide whether to stay vegetarian or non-vegetarian. When a man becomes non-vegetarian, he has in fact deliberately gone against nature and has deliberately inflicted a wrong diet upon himself. Since man has this capacity to deliberate and discriminate between different choices, therefore the diet is even more important for man than for any other animal. The capacity to discriminate itself is affected by the diet you take. People have been asking me this question, whether diet has anything to do with meditation. Of course, I have tried to explain to them the philosophy of vegetarian diet in relation to meditation. But even where I have not been able to persuade them 
to see my point of view in the philosophy of a vegetarian diet. One test that I have generally given to these students of diet has been very successfully working out and that test is try your power of concentration and meditation on a vegetarian diet, then try it on a non-vegetarian diet and note the difference. Whenever I have suggested to people to practice the two, to the best of my knowledge, an overwhelming majority of those who attempted this experiment have become vegetarians. The difference for those who are actually meditating is so great it does not take anyone to be a great observer of oneself to see the difference. Why does vegetarian diet have anything to do with meditation? The answer is that meditation of any kind, under any master, under any yoga, under any spiritual discipline, involves the concentration of human attention. You may concentrate your attention on a point behind the eyes, within yourself, or you may concentrate your attention on a point of a deity or an object of reverence or worship outside of yourself. In either case, all meditation is a practice of the art of concentrating human attention. How is human attention influenced by food? I'll explain to you presently. But first of all, let me take the example of a man who is reading a book page by page. The book is a very interesting book and he reads it at a certain pace which is natural to him. Maybe he reads two pages per minute of the book which is an interesting story. He will continue to read two pages per minute but if he were to interrupt his reading and go out and kill a man and come back and read the same book he will not be able to do even in five minutes a page. The book is the same, the language is the same, what is written in the book is the same, the capacity of the man to know the language and the words is the same, the eyes are the same, the reading ability is the same. What has gone wrong that the man cannot read the book as fast as he could earlier? The only thing that has been hurt by his going and killing a man has been his power to concentrate his attention. He is no longer able to concentrate his attention on that book. Of course, he will regain the power of concentration after some time. There will be a recovery period for the power of concentration to return. It may be a month, it may be two months, it may be six months, depending upon that individual man. But there is bound to be impairment of the power of concentrating attention and there is bound to be a lengthy period of recovery. On the other hand, if the same man goes out and kills a dog and comes back and reads the same book, he will find that again his power of concentrating the attention is affected, but the recovery time is much less. If that man goes and plucks an apple from a tree, and he comes to read the same book, he can time himself that his recovery time will still be there. His power to concentrate will still be affected, but very minutely and much less than what happened when he went and killed a dog and certainly much less than what happened when he killed a man. Why does killing a living being affect your power to concentrate your attention? This seems to be built into our conscious system that when we extinguish conscious beings, our own power of concentrating attention arising from that consciousness becomes less. This is a natural principle and can be tested at any time. There is enough empirical evidence to show that when life is extinguished, then the one who is associated with the extinguishing of life gets his own power of concentrating his attention affected depending upon the degree of intelligence in the life extinguished. Or on the other hand, one must not forget that life subsists on life. All living things live by extinguishing life of another order. It is not that we can live on stones and rocks. We have to live by extinguishing life. 
in nature, all life subsists by extinguishing other life. But since the degree of intelligence in life is different, it seems that the effect upon attention and its ability to concentrate is proportionate to the degree of intelligence in the life extinguished. If the power to concentrate attention is of some significance in human life, then it is necessary that man extinguishes life of the lowest degree of intelligence in order that his own power to concentrate his attention is not affected. The power to concentrate one's attention is relevant in life at every step. We cannot do our job well unless we have the power to concentrate our attention. We cannot make fr good friends if we do not have that power. We cannot have good relationships with our wife and children if we do not have this power. We cannot do anything successfully and effectively unless we have this power. On the other hand, when we want to use this power for attaining levels of higher awareness, it is even more necessary to have a sophisticated and developed power of concentrating human attention. In every sphere of human activity, therefore, the diet is of great importance and if the diet consists of food that has been produced by extinguishing life of a higher order of intelligence, it is bound to affect our own capabilities of doing things. A question is frequently asked that if extinguishing human life affects the power to concentrate attention, why should the eating of food from where life has already been extinguished by someone else if life has been extinguished from a chicken earlier and that chicken is brought in as human food, why should the eating of that chicken affect us? One can understand that if one goes and kills a man and comes and tries to read a book, his power is influenced and affected. But if somebody else has killed the man, why should one's power be affected? Well, this is a very interesting subject and involves a study of the functioning of the human subconscious. The subconscious mind does not function in the same way as the conscious mind. In fact, in many areas, it functions exactly the opposite to what the conscious mind would do. The conscious mind, conscious mind uses the intellect and takes conscious decisions. The subconscious mind does not use the intellect but just takes decisions on its own reaction to what is fed into it. The conscious mind avoids certain decisions by intellectualizing the pros and cons of the various options available before taking that decision. The subconscious mind has no such capability of deliberating upon the pros and cons and reacts naturally to the stimuli that are placed before it. The subconscious mind cannot be controlled by the deliberations of the conscious mind. In fact, the subconscious mind functions quite independently of what is going on in the conscious mind. The subconscious mind consists of all those so-called forgotten elements of experience, which we do not remember, but which still pop out from time to time through other means of manifestation from the subconscious mind. For example, this impairing of the power to concentrate on a book is not because you have deliberately decided to have lesser attention to concentrate on a book. This is a natural reaction arising from the subconscious mind. The loss of ability to concentrate on anything arises from what, ha what happens in the subconscious mind and is not related to what happens in the conscious mind. Thus, when we take food, the association of ideas with the food we are taking takes place in the subconscious mind and although we may not be the killers of the animals which have constituted the food, the subconscious mind reacts to it as if we are the killers. The subconscious mind becomes accountable for the extinguishing of life elsewhere by taking the food that we take. This has been studied by me over a long period of time in my capacity as the honorary advisor to the Institute for Study of Human Awareness. And over several years of study, I found out that even where a man was not the author of an action, but he absorbed that action into himself through any means, 
his subconscious mind accepted the authorship of that action. Food is only one of these things. There are many other things. For example, a man has not gone out and murdered a person, but he has gone and had dinner with a murderer. When he comes back, he finds his power of concentration has gone. Now, he has murdered no one. He has just been to a murderer and spent an evening with the murderer. But spending an evening with the murderer has absorbed into his subconscious system the accountability for the murder of the other man. And the loss in the power of concentrating his attention has occurred as if he had committed the murder. There are several instances I could quote to tell you how we vicariously pick up accountability for the actions of others. In the case of food which we eat, it is picked up immediately. And anyone can test out the veracity of this statement by his own experience. You eat the kind of food and see how it affects your power of concentrating your attention. You get the results immediately. This does not require too much research. It affects the power to concentrate attention in proportion to the degree of intelligence that existed in the animal that was whose life was extinguished. Thus, if big animals are eaten, the impairment is more. If smaller animals are eaten, the impairment is less. But if a lower order of life itself is extinguished, such as vegetables, plant kingdom, the impairment is considerably less. There is no direct relation between the two sets. One is so much less than the other. Where it is of relevance to us to develop the power to concentrate attention, the food that we eat becomes very relevant. I have said earlier that in every walk of life, we need to have the power to concentrate our attention. Therefore, in truth, a good vegetarian food which extinguishes life of the lowest order of intelligence is really good and will always be successful. But for those who want to go beyond ordinary chores of life and want to go into higher awareness through processes like meditation, it is an utmost necessity. If a person who is practicing meditation is not taking vegetarian food, he is continuously destroying the capacity to concentrate and therefore never attains any result in his meditation. By the time he recovers from the loss of power of concentration from his previous meal, he has taken another meal. So the process seems to go on. And those who take non-vegetarian meat foods all the time never get an experience of their own power to meditate and the power to have realization of concentration in their meditation. For those who want to go into higher realms of awareness through meditation, vegetarian food is a must. It should also be very light food. Light vegetarian food involving extinguishing of life at the lowest level of intelligence, which is the plant kingdom, is a must for a person who wants to concentrate his attention to reach higher levels of awareness. We must, therefore, prescribe a strictly vegetarian diet for a student of meditation and higher awareness. Some people may say, well, maybe once in a while we can have a non-vegetarian meal and still get the benefit of the vegetarian meal we have the rest of the time. This is not true, because by continually destroying the power of concentration which they build up, they give a setback, not for the time being, but continually. Meditation, like other realizations, is cumulative. You do not meditate afresh from beginning every time you sit in meditation. You meditate cumulatively and the previous meditations which have been done are also added up to what you are doing now. You progress from one session to another and therefore to get the cumulative benefit of the time you have spent and the attention you have given to meditation, you must not do anything which destroys this cumulative function. Those who believe that they can be generally vegetarians, but once in a while get off the vegetarian diet, are in fact destroying this cumulative effect and the cumulative function, and therefore they almost start afresh. 
when they begin meditation again after the non-vegetarian diet. To be really successful in meditation, you must not only have vegetarian food, you must have a consistent vegetarian food progressively helping you in your meditation. And this has to be kept up so that the previous time put into meditation continues to yield results. Thus, a vegetarian diet has to be taken on a long-term basis for those who want to practice meditation. What about the vegetarian diet and the body as such? People in different Western countries, particularly in the United States, have been telling me that vegetarian food may be good for the principles you have initiated. You have enunciated now on the power to concentrate attention. But what about the body itself? If the body itself is not well maintained, what good is it trying to concentrate attention in it? And very often I have been told that vegetarian food, as it is commonly understood in the West, has deficiency of proteins. And therefore they say, if there is inadequacy of proteins, you are not even putting the building blocks of your body into you. How do you expect to achieve any results spiritually or otherwise? Well, that is true. A vegetarian diet that I speak of is not supposed to be one that is deficient in proteins. I am not suggesting that you only take leafy vegetables and eat salads without any proteins. I am suggesting that there is enough range of vegetable proteins available for you to make up for any deficiency that you might experience. Working in developing countries, a team of experts in vegetarian foods found that the calorie protein malnutrition had occurred in certain developing countries because they did not supplement the leafy vegetables with adequate protein intake which was also available to them through vegetables. The beans for example, the peas, the lentils, the pulses which are all from the vegetable kingdom are adequate sources of vegetable protein and this protein ought to be taken along with other leafy vegetables in order to have a complete diet for the human body. The philosophy of vegetarianism does not say that you cut out proteins. I have not heard of that philosophy before. Therefore proteins have to be taken in but through vegetable sources. If you take vegetable proteins you are serving the body as well as the spirit. It has to be remembered that all proteins in the vegetable kingdom are not immediately available for assimilation in the human system. Take soybean for example, one of the very great sources of a good variety of protein. It contains basically all the amino acids that the body needs, except some sulfur-bearing amino acids which can always be supplemented by taking some additional proteins. A good soybean protein is useless in the human body if the trypsin inhibitor in soybean also continues to function. Now here is excellent vegetable protein available for vegetarian diets, yet if it is not properly treated, it can just be taken through the mouth and it passes out from the other end without assimilation in the body. It has been estimated that soya protein if taken without any treatment, is inhibited from getting into the human system to the extent of 80 to 85 percent. And therefore, we are losing a bulk of the protein in soybean. And yet, we can claim that we are taking vegetarian food, but somehow it is not good for our health. And that is why we are turning to non-vegetarian food. This argument is devised by those who do not know about vegetable proteins. The trypsin inhibitor in soybean, which prevents its assimilation in the human system, can be destroyed and the entire protein made free to reach the human digestive system by the simple device of heating the soybean. If the beans are boiled in water for 15 to 20 minutes before they are used in any form of preparation, the trypsin inhibitor is destroyed and the whole of the protein becomes available for assimilation. Old grandmothers who used to use soya bean for preparing foods used to boil them. They did not know why they boiled them, 
that we discovered several decades later. But we have found out that by boiling these beans, we make them the type of food that the human being needs. This is also true of other vegetable proteins. Each one has to be studied for its inhibitors, for its amino acid composition, for what it does to the human body. And an adequate combination of proteins properly treated gives you all the protein you need. And the protein is free from cholesterol, free from several harmful effects which the meat proteins have and is ideally suited for maintaining good bodily health. I have been working for a long time on vegetable proteins and I have experimented with what would constitute a good formula of vegetable protein which has adequate lysine, the important uh, amino acid, as well as the sulfur-bearing amino acids which are deficient even in soya protein so that a man can get all the protein he needs by taking a single dose, as it were, of a protein preparation made from vegetable sources. I have come to the conclusion that a good combination would be where one takes wheat germ or wheat flour to the extent of 75 to 80 percent, adds soya flour of about 20 percent or 15 percent, and uh, puts a topping of sesame seeds which have the sulfur-bearing amino acids to the extent of 5 to 10 percent. Different formulations using these ingredients would provide the best available protein that the world has yet known. Now here is field for experimentation and I'm sure many nutrition experts and dietitians are already working on this. Many new protein foods are being developed today which provide all the protein that you need. The point is, let us not be misled by any argument that the vegetable proteins are in any way inferior to the proteins available in eggs or in meats or anywhere else. In fact, they are superior to the proteins available elsewhere. So much for the protein intake by the human body. The vegetarian foods have the additional advantage of being light for digestion, have low cholesterol, have other advantages of assimilation in the system, are natural to us, and therefore help us in a natural process of meditation. For those who want to lead healthy, good lives with adequate time devoted to developing their inner capacities for higher awareness, there is no way out except to have a good, healthy vegetarian meal and good, healthy vegetarian food all the time. Thank you. If there are any questions, I shall be glad to answer. Yes, I have a question. Um, there are a lot of individuals who are very partial to the vegetarian diet. As a matter of fact, they are so partial to the vegetarian diet that they even refuse to take milk or cheeses or any uh, milk product. Now, believing this to be following a true vegetarian diet, uh, could you give us some type of insight into this. Uh, I was talking of vegetarian food as it affects our body, mind and spirit. I was not talking of any fad. These people who are even avoiding milk protein because it's coming from an animal source are following a fad. I am not suggesting that you become vegetarians because I am saying follow a particular vegetarian fad. I do hope the Vegetarian Health Society is propagating the value of vegetarian food for health and not the value of vegetarian food as a fad, as a cult, as a religion. If you make vegetarianism into religion, you will find people doing all these things. I have given you the reasons for taking up vegetarian food and according to that, milk and milk products is admissible and should be accepted in vegetarian diet. I'd like to ask you a question that I myself have been asked and to some extent, I'm a little bit confused. Now, say if an individual uh, goes into a health food store and, or say if an individual uh, is being fed soybean protein that looks like meat and tastes like meat, and someone tells him that it is meat, 
and he's under the illusion due to the fact that it looks like meat and tastes like meat is meat. Does the subconscious pick up this as being meat and therefore he gets the penalty of killing an animal? Well, first, how does this work? Well, first of all, I would like to clarify that I was not referring to the concept of penalty or punishment for sin. I am not talking of in terms of sin and punishment. And I am not saying that because you are eating this food, you are committing sin and you will be punished for that. I was talking directly in terms of psychological impact on human subconscious. Fortunately for you and fortunately for us, the food laws of all the countries, including yours, have made it necessary that the labeling should be very accurate. And if you are using vegetarian protein, you have to label it as vegetarian protein. Do you know that uh, about 10 or 12 years ago, when textured vegetable protein first came into your country, and became a good substitute for meats. Hamburgers were made without using beef, but by using these substitutes made from soya protein. And some of the companies who used to make hamburgers began to introduce 5%, 10% of soya protein in addition to beef. And they sold them as hamburgers till the Federal Food Department here noticed it and warned them that even if you use 5% of vegetable protein, you cannot call it meat. Therefore, of course, you had a great number of Jimmy's burgers and Joe's burgers and all those coming up, where the word ham hamburger could not be used, beef burger could not be used. Therefore, the question you have raised is theoretical and hypothetical. In fact, when a person goes into a health food store, and although he wants to take up a vegetarian product which tastes like meat, which has a chewability texture like meat, he wants vegetable protein. So when he wants a vegetable protein, looks at the label and finds it is vegetable protein. Even though it tastes like beef, it tastes and has the flavor of beef, he is not affected in the subconscious because it is not meat. And there is no delusion in his mind because he has taken it up as vegetarian food. Today you will find that the people who are looking for substitutes for meat, which look like meat, which taste like meat, which chew like meat, which have the grain like meat, these people are looking for them not because they are looking for meat in disguise, they are looking for vegetables in disguise. They want to buy vegetable food in disguise because they have got used to that. They are their taste buds, their palates have got used to meat foods and they will find it easier to switch over to vegetarian foods if they get vegetarian foods which are disguised like meat foods. So the point you have raised is very hypothetical, is not likely to come up. It's not a problem that will come up. On the other hand, people will jump at the idea that, well, I have turned a vegetarian, yet I can have the same taste and the same flavor and the same chewability and the same feeling in my teeth as I had when I used to take meat. It's a great advance. You are, if you are able to produce those foods for vegetarians, then you are really helping the growth of vegetarianism in a big way. Well, we do plan on having products of vegetable protein available for the vegetarian clientele. Well, I think the Vegetarian Health Society will be doing a great service if it can produce a complete range of completely vegetarian foods, but with all kinds of tastes, so that people have the least difficulty switching over to the proper foods.